Hello, welcome to Feasting on the Word for this week, March the 1st, 2023, the beginning of March, hard to believe. First off, I need to apologize for those who may have been looking for Feasting on the Word last week and never saw it. The week just got away from me and somehow I forgot to get Feasting on the Word up there and I'm a little embarrassed about that as the discipline of Feasting on the Word began now a few years ago. I think it's been going since 2020, so we are on our third year in the season of Lent as a discipline of Lent. And so missing last week, the first week of Lent, is a little bit of an embarrassment to me. But I think given with Ash Wednesday and other things happening, um, it just uh, escaped my mind. Nonetheless, here we are this week and setting ourselves back on the discipline of feasting on the Word. This is an ancient practice of the Christian church, one in which the intention is to simply immerse ourselves in God's word. Well, how do we do that? We take a small passage of scripture and hear that same passage repeated to us and repeated with only silence interspersed between the readings. This affords us a time to sit with that passage a little more, and so it's likened to feasting on the word in the sense of hearing it and sort of beginning to appreciate uh, the, what it has to say, hearing it a second time and savoring its flavor, hearing it a third time and sort of beginning to really break it down and incorporate it into our lives, and then a fourth and final time to nourish us from the depths of our being out into our lives and our world. So there's a minute of silence following the first reading, a minute following the second reading, and a longer period of three minutes following the third reading as an opportunity to turn to God in prayer, having experienced that scripture three times. So taking how it is challenging, confusing, inspiring, encouraging, whatever it might be to God in prayer through that longer period of three minutes of silence, and then we conclude the discipline with a fourth and final reading. One of the little tweaks that I have done in our discipline of this is to use four different translations of the same passage. So again, it's the same passage of Scripture, but just using four translations as a way to hear it a little different each time to really appreciate all that it has to say to us. So let's get into Feasting on the Word for this week. Our passage is taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 10 through 18, beginning with the New Revised Standard Version. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every aspect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested.
Our second reading of Hebrews chapter 2 verses 10 through 18 from the message. It makes good sense that the God who got everything started and keeps everything going now completes the work by making the salvation pioneer perfect through suffering as he leads all these people to glory. Since the one who saves and those who are saved have a common origin, Jesus doesn't hesitate to treat them as family, saying, I'll tell my good friends, my brothers and sisters, all I know about you. I'll join them in worship and praise to you. Again, he puts himself in the same family circle when he says, Even I live by placing my trust in God. And yet again, I'm here with the children God gave me. Since the children are made of flesh and blood, it's logical that the Savior took on flesh and blood in order to rescue them by his death. By embracing death, taking it into himself, he destroyed the devil's hold on death and freed all who cower through life, scared to death of death. It's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. It was for people like us, children of Abraham. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then, when he came before God as high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help where help was needed. Our third reading of Hebrews chapter 2 verses 10 through 18 from the contemporary English version with our longer period of silence to follow. Everything belongs to God, and all things were created by his power. So God did the right thing when he made Jesus perfect by suffering, as Jesus led many of God's children to be saved and to share in his glory. Jesus and the people he makes holy all belong to the same family. This is why he isn't ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. He even said to God, I will tell them your name and sing your praises when they come together to worship. He also said, I will trust God. And then he said, here I am with the children God has given me. We are people of flesh and blood. This is why Jesus became one of us. He died to destroy the devil who had power over death. But he also died to rescue all of us who live each day in fear of dying. Jesus clearly did not come to help angels, but he did come to help Abraham's descendants. He had to be one of us so he could serve God as our merciful and faithful high priest and sacrifice himself for the forgiveness of our sins. And now that Jesus has suffered and was tempted, he can help anyone else who is tempted.
Our fourth and final reading of Hebrews chapter 2 verses 10 through 18 from the New International Version. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I, the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.